This message is part of the teaching provided by House on the Rock Fellowship, a church caring for the Miami Valley region. Before you listen, be sure to access the notes in the download section of the message page. Have a Bible ready. Thank you for being our guest. Comedy and tragedy. You've seen these symbols before, these masks before. Happy face and a sad face. Some recognize them as theater. But in classical Greek theater, they were so much more. A tragic story, a comedic story. In essence, coming down to how the story ends. A tragic play in Greek theater often took place in fanciful settings and fanciful storylines, but ended tragically. An example, a man goes to the underworld to save his wife from death only to find out he can't get out when he gets there. That's a tragedy. Comedy, a little different than how we use the term today, was often a story for the common man with common problems and common challenges, but the story ends well. You leave with a happy face. So if you were in the ancient Near East, you were surrounded with these stories. Stories of tragedy, stories of comedy. But today you're surrounded with these stories again. Perhaps you, living a life of tragedy. Maybe living a life of celebration. And maybe you're wondering... I feel like I'm living this. Is there any way that I could find this? Is that possible? Is it possible to have your story changed? That's why we're here. That's what we believe. And for the last two months, we've kind of been anchoring ourselves here at House on the Rock, if you're a guest, in those core beliefs, those core ideas. I believe in God, the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. That means I believe that God is the source of life. God cares about his creation and what's going on here. God cares intimately, infinitely about what's happening in the Ukraine. He cares about humanity. He cares about the earth. That's why I say I believe in God the Father Almighty. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. That God in his infinite compassion and grace sees that This needs restored and fixed and healed. And Jesus Christ came to be that healing, that restoration, that new human, that better king. Conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, who suffered under Pontius Pilate. We don't deny the presence of suffering. How many of you experienced suffering this week? Only a couple. We're doing good. That's awesome. Sweet. We can cut this short. I'm going to get to Lee's chicken early. (laughs) How many of you experienced suffering this week? Thank you for being an honest follower of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus suffered. And what did he say? You'll experience suffering. He was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. Not triumphed over, but as victor. Bursting through the doors. Claiming victory. He rose again, ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in a God that broods and hovers over our chaos. Who is drawing forth life out of the ashes of death. I believe in that. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. Catholic meaning global, all time. 
that I am intimately and infinitely connected to the church in Ukraine and the church in Russia, that we are a part of the church in Europe and the church for the last 2,000 years. I believe a connection there. As my brothers and sisters suffer over there, so we suffer here. But as we pray here and engage here, the kingdom grows over there. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? Sanction all you want. We'll get the real work done. But I also believe in the communion of saints. The love and grace that we're called to walk in together here. The local expression of the body of Christ. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. This world is messed up. But I'm called to walk in community with God and called to walk in community one with another. So no matter where you have been, no matter what the week has been, God is making things right. And today, in your notes, what else do I believe? I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Did you write that down? If you're online, write that down. I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting as we bring this series to a close today. If you haven't been able to be with us uh, through the whole Creed series, you can go to whoishouseontherock.com and catch up and listen to those parts. But I pray that you see the last line of the Creed makes sense. It's the climax of the story. It's where the story should go. If I believe in a God that is the source of all life and I live in a world that's a jacked up hot mess, then I believe that at some point he's gonna make everything right. I believe in the resurrection of the body. I believe in life everlasting. To help us unpack that, we're going to go to what's called the resurrection chapter in the Bible. And that's 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm not going to let Carmen put the verses up on the screen today because I want you to experience this tangibly, tactilely in your hand. So if you brought a Bible, awesome. If you didn't, there's blue ones located in the seats in front of you. If you would take those out. If you're not real good at maneuvering the Bible, and I know it's a complicated, lots of little books and some bigger books in order. In the blue books, it's page 559. Find 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I do read scripture uh, on a phone at times. I have a tablet and sometimes I read it there. But I have found that it's really easy for me to get distracted if I'm reading it off of a device. Because there's other things on my phone that at times can be a whole lot more alluring. Um, Shopping lists and notifications and Twitter feeds. I don't tweet anything. Um, so that's why this morning, maybe we could pick up a, one of these, kind of help us be present a little bit, because I am going to move through a lot of scripture, and I want you to be able to follow along together. The so 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is the resurrection chapter, and it's going to help us anchor ourselves in this whole series and what it means to say, I believe in the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. Father God, please, by the power of your spirit, bless your word this morning. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel. I know the gospel. Why do I need to be reminded of it? Apparently, the gospel is something you need to be reminded of. When I'm watching Fox or CNN or BBC or news feeds, I need to remember the gospel. When I see tanks move into cities and occupy villages, I need to remember the gospel. When I get a report from my doctor, I need to remember the gospel. When I have a fight with my spouse, I need to remember the gospel. The gospel is something we always come back to. It's one of the reasons for so many, so many hundreds of years, whenever the saints gather together, what do they do? They remind themselves of the gospel. And in Jesus Christ, our Lord, I would remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you're being saved, if you hold fast. Apparently the gospel is something I have to hold on to. 
cling to and cleave to. It's not going to turn its back on me, but I can turn my back on it. Hold fast to the word I preached you unless you believed in vain. That word vain is going to come up multiple times in this chapter. It means emptiness. Think of it as the tension between a tragic life and a life of celebration. The comedy story. And I don't want a life of emptiness. I don't want to get to the end and my life be defined by tragedy. For I delivered to you as of first importance. First importance means that there's some things that matter more than other things. There's some things that you can chase through this week and some things matter and some things don't. We have been reminding ourselves for the last two months what matters most. What I received, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture. He was buried, he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scripture. He appeared to Cephas and to the 12. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. Most of whom are still alive. Some have fallen asleep. That's important. If you're a person who likes to d- doodle in your Bible circle, and I would, I would make note of that phrase, fallen asleep. Kind of like what some of you are doing right now. Um, just kidding. You wouldn't know it. But I'm happy for you. Well done. Good job. This is how Paul describes death for someone who's in Christ. He describes it as falling asleep. We're going to see in a little bit towards the end of our time, that's how Jesus described death. It's falling asleep. There's something in that for us this morning. And we'll come back to it again. Then he appeared to James, to all the apostles. Last of all, to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I'm least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible, by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. There's that idea of vain again, empty. Paul says the difference, the Apostle Paul says the difference between my life being a tragic story and my life being one of celebration is the grace of God. God's grace took me from a path that was of tragedy, persecution, death, and sin, and he put me on something else. It's God's grace that has changed me. By God's grace, I am what I am. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that's with me. Whether then it was I or they, we preach and you believe. Paul says the transformation, the gift of God's grace is the reason he gets up in the morning. The reason he shares about the resurrection and he teaches about the forgiveness of sins. He says, my life is not going to be empty. It's going to be a life of purpose. Now he gets to the challenge. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? This was apparently a problem in the church. There were teachers who were putting forth that there was no resurrection of the dead. That's a big deal. It's such a big deal. Paul places it here in the letter. Meaning what? Scholars look at the letter of 1 Corinthians and they say, you know, it's a lot like how a script is composed for the theater. They see a lot of connections between comedy plays and tragic plays that were in the Greek theater, in the Corinthian theater, and say, Paul wrote his letter a lot like that. Because you know when you get to the end of a good story, what makes it a good story? It's the way it ends, right? It's the ending. Like, ah! She loves him, and he loves her. I love this story. The dog died. Of course the dog died. You never watch a movie with a dog in it. The dog always dies. That's a tragedy. The Apostle Paul, what does he put at the end of the letter? And this is a letter to a church that's jacked up. I mean, it's bad. They are fighting incessantly, and the sin, the I mean, they're, they're, to-do list is a heartbreaker. But he says, you know what's going to transform this story of tragedy into one of celebration? 
we're going to end with the resurrection. That's what you need to be reminded of. The resurrection. So he says, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Verse 13. If there's no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is in vain. And your faith is in, say it, vain. You believe it's empty. There's nothing to it. There's no value to it. If there's no resurrection, watch what he says. We're even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it's true that there's no dead who were raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins, also known tragedy. Then those who, who have fallen asleep in Christ, they've perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Yeah, fallen asleep. We're not fallen asleep. He says we've perished. Those who have died have perished, meaning they've been destroyed. They've met destruction. It's all about the resurrection. If there's no resurrection, your faith is vain, it's futile, and all of the obedience and the living and the choices and the persecution, we are to be most pitied because it doesn't mean anything. Paul's letting us know that this issue is a big theological point. Verse 20, but in fact... Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Back to that fallen asleep idea. For as by a man came death, and by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. You think you're alive, but not yet. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom of God to the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And what does he mean? Because he's going to connect these two theological ideas for us because I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. He says this is important because there is an end to this chapter. There is a point where we go from this page to the next where Jesus has done what the Father sent him to do which was to confront sin and conquer death. And he's going to use the term, term subject. Christ has subjected himself to the Father. It doesn't mean that Christ is inferior to God the Father. It means he came to do what the Father asked him to do. He submits himself to this rescue mission. And the page doesn't turn, the end doesn't come until that subjection has completely happened. For he must reign, Christ, until he has put all his enemies under his foot. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Verse 27, for God has put all things in subjection under his feet. Quoting the Psalms. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it's plain that he is expected who put all things in subjection under him. We know that this is what Christ is going to do. Verse 28, when all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all and end all. A lot of curly cues and circles saying this, Christ is doing the work that the Father sent him to do, that again, finally, the Father will be all and in all. Creation will again be saturated with the life that is divine, the way it was designed and intended to be. We're not there yet. So the body still works, the body of Christ. Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? 
If the dead are not raised at all, why are people being baptized on their behalf? All right, so that's a neat one. Let's sit here for a little bit. Can you do that? Can you be baptized on behalf of the dead? This is what he means. I know I will see my father again. I know that. My father passed away some years ago. I know I will see him again. You have loved ones in Christ. You know that you will see again, right? The idea of the resurrection of the body is so prevalent that some people were coming to the baptism covenant knowing, willingly, that by stepping into the baptism waters, by giving themselves over to the kingdom, they were also doing it to again experience that relationship with those who have passed on, who have fallen asleep. So you're telling me that if I follow Jesus, I get to see my dad again too? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. I won't be separated from my loved ones? Mm Mm-mm. All right. Not that my baptism alters their trajectory. Okay, that's not what he's saying. But they come to the baptism knowing that there is a resurrection of the body, there is life everlasting. I don't just get to experience life with Jesus. I get to have a renewed life with my father or my loved ones or those who had passed away. I hope that makes sense. Why are we in danger every hour? Paul's going to talk about his life. Why does he go through all the crazy stuff he goes through? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die every day. What do I gain if, humbly speaking, I fought with beasts in Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let's eat, drink, and tomorrow die. Let me put it this way. There are no doubt those who have, because of their love for for Jesus, head on over to to Ukraine right now. There are those brothers and sisters, missional hearts, who have sent themselves and been sent by churches into the hot mess that is Kiev. And the surrounding villages and cities throughout Ukraine. They are going to their death in some cases, perhaps. And likewise, Paul's saying, listen, if there's no resurrection, why would we do that? Why would we put ourselves in front of the tanks? Why would we run into the burning buildings to pull the bodies out? Why would we sit with those whose bodies are racked with plague or radiation or whatever it might be, knowing that we're going to die? Because we know we don't die. In fact, Christians, we forget to die. We just go on to better life. So he says, I die all the time. If the dead are not raised, let's eat and drink and tomorrow, I'm not going to Ukraine. Let's just hang out here and have a good old time. No, he says, no, 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 no. Don't be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Meaning don't hang out with that idea. That's actually a quote from a very famous Greek play at the time. Wake up from your drunken stupor as is right and do not go on sinning for some have no knowledge of God. And I say this to your shame. The people in Corinth might be like some of us in our comfortable American cities and churches. Oh, we'll just, you know, we'll, we'll just sanction them. That, that, that'll take care of it. Yeah. And Paul would plead with us. He says, some there have no knowledge of God. Some in the Ukraine have no knowledge of God. Some in St. Petersburg have no knowledge of God. In the middle of that war, there are people who have no knowledge of God and you're doing nothing about it. You're not entering the fray. You're not entering the storm. Not with bullets, but with prayers. Not with tanks, but with songs of celebration. He says, I say this to your shame. Shame on you. Don't you believe in the resurrection? But some will ask, how? How? How are the dead raised? Like, give me the details. That's a good American question. I want to know how. Like, do I get wings or not? Am I going to be seven feet tall? Will I glow? Do I get my hair back? I would like my hair back. (laughs) 
Am I going to look the way I pretend that I look when I look in the mirror? Like, yeah. Like, how is this going to happen? What kind of upgrade do we get? Like, what's the 2.0? What's the 3.0? I want to know how. And look at Paul's response. You're a fool. You foolish person. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. He, he uses that imagery of planting a seed. Okay, I plant, I plant a seed and out grows a tree. It's how did that tree come from that seed? It's not the same. There's a difference there. God gives it a body as he has chosen and to each kind of seed its own body. I highlighted that word gives. Whatever it is to be is a gift of God's grace. Whatever it is, it's grace. And God will decide what it is to be. This helps me from a pastoral perspective. Well, what if someone has passed away and they wanted to be cremated? Is it okay to be cremated? Is that destroying the body? Or what if a body's been lost at sea? Or what if a body's been destroyed in an IED? Or what happens to the, what, what, what's going to happen? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. He's going to take whatever, however he likes, and by his grace, he's going to make something more, and it's going to be different. You're not even the same body that you were when you were born. And science tells us the cells completely, every seven years, you're completely new. Some of you have gone through a lot of iterations. <laughs> when we die, it's going to be something different that awakes. And just, yeah, I'll get to it. For not all flesh is the same. There's one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind. The glory of the earthly is another. There's one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for stars differ from star in glory. My body has a glory about it because it was created by God. And it's beautiful. He again is, is giving value to the body. And this was a culture and a time that undermined the value of the body. It's created by God. It has a glory. But what will come after it will have its own glory. Because that's what God gives. Verse 42. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It's sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. Notice the quality. In some sense, it's not best that we say, I believe in the life everlasting, as in the goal is to live forever. Like in and of itself, that's kind of not cool. It's just live forever? No, no. He says, look at the qualitative difference in our reality once the resurrection of the body has happened. What you have now is perishable. It breaks and is broken. It gets damaged and hurt. It groans and falls apart. It's perishable. But the resurrected body is imperishable. There's another quality about it. That body, sown in dishonor. You are born a naked, gooey, wrinkly mess. Okay? You've seen babies born. That's gross. And some of them you're like, mmm, gotta cook longer. That one's not ready. But what happens afterwards? The harvest is glorious. This is the body's weak. This body is weak. But the one to be is one of power. It's qualitatively different. It's one of the reasons he can look at, at death and say, it's like falling asleep. It's not something to be feared. 
What happens on the other side? There is a natural body. There is a spiritual body. Thus it was written, the first man, Adam, became a life, a living being. The last Adam, meaning Christ, became a life-giving spirit. It's not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. The first man was on earth. A man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. Dust. It's me. As is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, so we shall also, beautiful, bear the image of the man of heaven. If you want another passage to look at later today or maybe this week, if you want to meditate on this, you go to Romans chapter 8 and look at verses 9, 10, and 11, where Paul recognizes the body. But those who are in Christ have the spirit. And it's the spirit that gives life. Some wonder and will ask, well, all right, immediately, like, what happens? Like, I die, and then what? Biblical perspective. A biblical perspective. There's two phases you kind of have to have in mind. There's this in-between where the Holy Spirit of God keeps my spirit in living state, somehow conscious. Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. So when he talks about falling asleep, he doesn't mean soul sleep, as some people teach. There's a consciousness, there's a wakeness. The Holy Spirit has me, some aspect of me, with him, until what? The resurrection of the body. When the soul then becomes that which is imperishable, that which is glorious. Something more. We were driving over to Bennett's house last night. He was making beef tongue tacos and invited me. They were good. They were actually really good. At least had adobo chicken tacos. They were good too. Bennett's a good cook. And on our way over to Bennett's house, uh, the sun was coming down. And as we were coming up into Covington, the sun was just glistening over the top of the grass and the fields and the trees that were still encrusted with the ice. And you still see it today, maybe as you're driving over this morning. Right? And you remember, you know what I'm talking about? I mean, it, it, was, it was the grass, but it was more. There was a radiance about it. That something had been covered the tree was still the tree, but there was a radiance about it. It was more. The resurrected body is going to be more as it glistens in the sun. Verse 50. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the, Im the, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I love this. I tell you a mystery. What's that mean? What's that mean when he pauses? It's a mystery. He even says, behold, hey, time out. Pay attention. It's a mystery. What's, he, what's Paul saying? Truth be told, I don't know. That's what he's saying. You know, there's just part. Uh, uh, uh. But it's going to be good. It's going to be great. It's worth living for. It's worth dying for. I believe in the resurrection of the body. Behold, it's a mystery. We shall not all sleep, meaning there's, at this point, some of us won't go through death, but we will all be changed. There's a transformation in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. This is not trumpet from the book of Revelation kind of trumpet. Okay, That book was written after this letter. So Paul's not referencing what John wrote in the book of Revelation. This is the trumpet that sounds when the king has said, it's time to move. This is the summoning trumpet. This is the attention-getting trumpet. This is the declaration that that story is over, and we're moving to this story now. For this perishable body must put on imperishable. The mortal body must put on immortality. And when the perishable puts on the imperishable, the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death 
He is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? For the sting of death is sin and the power of sin, the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through Lord Jesus Christ. Go back into the middle of verse 54. Then shall come to pass. When God decrees by his grace, by his providence and sovereignty, when it's time for this to happen, then, then death will be conquered. We face death now. I'm going to do a funeral on Saturday. I will do more funerals. We battle death. We face death. We battle sin. We face sin. It's part of reality. It's part of the current. But there will come a time. Behold, and it's a mystery, but the trumpet will sound, will be changed, and death will be conquered. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. In the middle of the chapter and here at the end, he calls us to action both times. The first one, he kind of punches us in the gut. He's like, hey, you're living shamefully. No more of this, hey, let's eat, drink, and be merry stuff. Rather, be steadfast. Be immovable. Be, be, be abounding. Be overflowing in the spirit life. How many of you had an abounding life this, this week? Was it abounding? Did it abound? Or was it pretty lousy. For the spirit has come that life would abound. What did Jesus say in John 10, 10? I have come that they would have life overflowing. How do we do that? How do we walk in that? I want to take you to two stories in the book of John pretty quickly, just so we can see how to live this out. And the first one is in John 11, where we see the theme of resurrection. If you're a churchy person who grew up here in churchy stories, and this one's going to be familiar, John 11, this is the story of Jesus raising Lazarus. If you're using the blue Bibles, that's page 523. Page 523. Love hearing that sound. I'm a Bible nerd. It's cool. I love it. John 11. Jesus had dear friends, Lazarus, Mary, Martha, these were his closest friends. Whenever Jesus would visit Jerusalem, he'd stay at Bethany, he'd stay at their house. Jesus was kind of like, you know, he had refrigerator rights. You guys know that kind of friend, right? Just walk in the door, you don't have to knock on the door. Some of you have refrigerator rights at our house. Some of you think you have refrigerator rights at our house. You know what I mean? You just come in and you just go to the fridge and you just help yourself. Yeah. Jesus, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, that type of friendship. That type of friendship. Lazarus got sick. Sister sent word to Jesus. Jesus didn't do anything about it. Waited, in fact, until Lazarus died. And Jesus, in his spirit, knowing that Lazarus passed away, said this to his disciples. This is John eleven eleven. 11. After talking to his disciples, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. I go to awaken him. There it is again. When God talks about death, when Jesus talks about death, he describes it as falling asleep. That's something for me. I need to learn how to label death correctly. What is death? It's falling asleep. The disciples are like, well, if he's asleep... What's the big deal? Well, just get up. Jesus then says, verse 14, Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe. Jesus is gonna do something in the presence of Lazarus' death that's gonna call them to believe. Call for a transformation in a story from a tragic story to one of celebration. Jesus makes his way to the town, makes his way to Bethany, which is just outside of Jerusalem. Sisters run out to him. Why didn't you come? Why didn't you help your friend? Do you ever ask God these questions? Why didn't you do this? I asked you to help. Jesus says, I am the resurrection, verse 25. 
I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, it shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me, love this, shall never die. Like someone said, Christians are people who forget how to die. We just live. Jesus goes to the tomb. He sees Mary weeping. He sees family weeping. He sees other Jews in the area weeping. Verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Is he weeping for Lazarus? Why is he weeping? He saw Mary grieving. He saw family grieving. He saw others grieving. Jesus let himself be touched by their grief. Is he grieving over Lazarus? No. What does God say? He's asleep. I just got to wake him up. You have toddlers that can do that, right? You have toddlers who have woken you up. To Jesus, I just got to go wake him up. That's all this is. He's just sleeping. But Jesus sees their grief. He sees their sadness. And he lets himself be touched by their pain. He enters into their tragedy. He knows this is going to end differently. He knows what can be. But he sits with those who grieve. I think that's an important part of helping people's stories change. You saw pictures of the tanks, right? Did you see the one where that tank just completely went and, and totaled that car with that old man inside? You see that one? The tank was going down there and all of a sudden he, just, he power slid hard and went up over this car. You saw armies running and you saw missiles and you saw planes and you saw refugees running. Were you able to cry with them this week? Did you, did you let it touch you? As mother and father send their child down the road and then head back into Kiev so they can fight for their town. Did you let it wreck you? You can cry even though you know that Jesus will make it right for no other reason than the fact that it makes them sad that they're, they're hurting. So we as the body of Christ, we hurt too. And we weep with those who weep. Even though we know how the story changes. And we know what Jesus will do. For justice will prevail. We believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. He says, move the stone out of the way. They're like, he gonna stink. He been dead for four days. He gonna, it gonna, and move the stone. Lazarus, come out. <laughs> I wanted to see this so bad, because he can't move. He's kind of like, you know, <laughs> He's wrapped head to toe. He's got herbs and ointments and oils lathered all over him. And Jesus looks and says, would someone go untie him? Literally, at the, at the end, is unbind him and let him go. And in that, I see Jesus also speaking into the reality of sin and death. And he says, sin, you're unbound to him. Death, let him go. Because I believe and the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Let me show you one more story, and this is just a couple pages over in John 20, because I think there's two things in this that help us believe and hold on to it. In John 20, 
John anchors his gospel in the story of creation. That's why if you read the beginning of John's gospel, it has a lot of Genesis creation language in it. In the beginning was the word. And so John sees Resurrection Sunday as the point where everything changes. That's why in in chapter 20, now, first one, on the first day of the week, Again, he says this in verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, meaning we're in new creation territory now. New creation has come. The doors being locked, this is verse 19, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood amongst them and said, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you as the Father sent me. I'm sending you. That's awesome. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. For I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only son, our Lord, conceived of the Holy Spirit. He, the Father, sent him to do a work of restoration and rescue. And Jesus does not as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. You are now conceived, born by the Holy Spirit. Go, let's save this world. He's inviting you, participate in a new creation movement. Confront death. Stand in front And wave the banner that says, a better king has come. Thomas, one of the 12, verse 24, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said, unless I see in his hands the marks of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails, place my hand into his side, I'll never believe. I respect that. I respect Thomas being honest. Yeah, you know, unless I touch, I I don't, uh uh-uh. Eight days later, the disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked and Jesus came and stood amongst them and said, peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Put your hand, place in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Walking in a belief of the resurrection. Being Jesus to others. Like to Thomas. I think means being honest and open with our wounds. And our brokenness. Thomas, this is, this is where I've been hurt. Thomas, this is where I was cut. Thomas, this is what the world did to me. Thomas, it did not defeat me. I'm here to give you life. There is something in that. Helping tragic stories enter into celebration. Being honest with ourselves and honest with others. I've been hurt. I've been cut. I've been shot. He did this, she did this, I did this to myself. Oh, but Jesus gave me life. And he put the pieces back together again. Someone bearing that level of faith and love, oh, change the world. That'll change the world. I believe in God the Father, almighty maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, God's only son, our Lord, who was conceived the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended 
heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father, almighty, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you for sharing your time with us, and we'd love for the journey to continue. If you're a guest, would you consider reaching out to us? We would love to come alongside and encourage you in any way that we can. If you're someone who's joined us today, and you are desperately reaching to find hope wherever you can, again, Jesus came that we would find hope. You can find hope today. If you want to send us a short note, a member of our hope team would reach out quickly, promptly, to come alongside and see what we can do to encourage you in whatever storm you might find yourself in. That's why Jesus came, and that's why we're here. Jesus said there's two ways to live your life, and a wise man, a wise woman, builds their life on Jesus' instructions. God bless.